Hey, welcome back. Oof, that was a big flash in my eye. Uh, welcome back to the studio. Always happy to have you here. Today we're doing a mini studio tour. I'm going to show you around the space, how I organize the space, how I use the space, as well as a QA. and a I asked you guys to submit in some questions. They're rolling in right now, so we'll see how I structure this video. I'm mostly going to cover corners of the studio, how I organize the space, clean the space, etc. I'm not so much going to go into the layout of it. I did cover that in my last video, so I do recommend you watch that one if you're interested. Yeah, let's get into it. So this is the corner that I spend probably most of my time in other than on my wheel, on this this shelf slash desk space and this one. As you can see, I'm working on my next collection, which is coming mid-September. <clears throat> Should be September 15th, kiln gods willing, but to be confirmed once I start to get things fired. Speaking of firing, there were a few questions asking about where do I get my stuff fired? Do I have a kiln? Where did I put my kiln? So I don't have a kiln here. This is a temporary home studio and I just couldn't put a kiln in this rental apartment. I also know that I'm not going to stay here a very long time. So I don't have a kiln here. I fire my stuff at a kin, which is on St. Clair. They have a kiln there and Rose is the best. She's a kiln genius. It's like a um, community art studio space where artists rent small spaces and they all work together and because Rose set up a kiln there there's a lot of ceramicists and there's a lot of cool stuff that's being made so that's the kiln situation so what I do is I make all my stuff here I let them dry on the shelves and then I pack them with paper in cardboard boxes yeah this is um, the shelf usually where I put all the stuff that I want to dry or that I'm making so I can line them up I did realize that having space to put things is something that I I struggle a little bit with in this space. This used to be more of a display shelf, now it's really to put stuff that's dry. And then how I used to organize this shelf was to work from stuff that needs to be trimmed, stuff that needs to be bisque fired, stuff that needs to be glazed, but now because I have so much stuff I'm just piling up as much as I can in the shelf, so I'm no longer using that system. Down here, I don't know why every time I do these studio tour videos, I'm always crouching down in a weird position. Okay, so down here we have all of the tools and raw materials. And so in these big bins, I have all my raw materials that I use for glazing. So they're mostly packed in paper bags that are then wrapped in plastic bags. And in here I have like big bags of raw materials, like five kilo bags. It's not very nice. If I were staying here longer, I would have organized this differently. I probably would have gotten like big jars, you know, like how people organize their pantry sometimes. They put like almonds and flour and stuff. I would store them, like put them in a big jar and then label it so it's easier to scoop from. I have some scales here as well. I use this one a lot. I use this one mostly for weighing um, clay and large quantities. And this one is more, it's a precision one. It goes down to 0 0.01 gram. And I use that for glazing, especially for, uh, for formulating glazes. Next up, I have a bunch of other little, these are all crates from Hay, by the way. Um, I have all of my, like, this is just a random one, actually. There's just stuff that I don't really use in here. Like this one's mostly glazing material. So brushes, tongs, scoops. This one is my packing material stuff. So tape and mostly tape. I also have a uh, plaster bat and a wooden MDF bat here, as well as some, oops, calipers and a big ruler that I hide away. I have a lot of wrapping paper that's hidden down here. So like newsprint paper like this that I use for packing uh, my ceramics, either when I go to the kiln or when I pack orders. Oh, and lastly too, I also have um, lots of sanding paper tucked away in here when stuff needs to be sanded. Moving on. What's a pottery? Thank you for this pertinent question, Richard. I'm afraid you'll have to find out for yourself. But what I can say is that on the other side of this red shelf is the reclaim and wedging station. No, in all seriousness, this is where I wedge up on here. 
And what I've done is I put heavy uh, buckets and clay. Actually, usually I have this whole shelf covered in clay, like clay bags to hold the weight of the shelf down. Oh my gosh, there's an airplane. Each year in September, there's an airplane show. I thought maybe they would have canceled it this year. My poor dog is terrified. I'm sorry, buddy, you wanna come here? Yeah, you wanna come here? You wanna come hang out with me? It's okay, it's all right. I put clay bags here so it weighs down the shelf so that when I'm re uh, wedging, it doesn't uh, push the shelf too much. And then I also take advantage of putting a lot of wet reclaimed clay on this middle shelf here. So it's also pulling the weight of the shelf down. Next shelf here is the biggest shelf I have in the studio. So going from the top to down, I store all of the stuff that I don't want to see up here, basically. So I have like my glazing sieve. There's a bunch of bowls and spatulas in there. Next up, we've got the shelves that I pretty much already covered. It's mostly stuff that needs to be bisque fired. Most of it is coming out mid-September for the next collection. Bowls, little footed coops. Moving down here, I have the mirror. Um, that I use to, while I sit at the wheel, I can see the profile of my pieces so I don't have to like bend down in weird positions to look at the profile. And it's actually fine that it's far away. Then I've got my speaker, Yui Boom. I like to listen to podcasts and audiobooks when I'm on the wheel or when I work in here. And then I also have another crate and it's mostly all the tools that I access the most. Trimming tools, throwing tools, sponges. So I put it here for easy access because it's easy for me to find the tools that I want. And when I once I'm done cleaning them, I can just easily store them here. All right, introducing the bucket cleaning system that I use. I have for my white clay body, two reclaim buckets. I don't know if you can see the clay that's in there. It's a little heavy for me to show you, but that's what it looks like. Any clay that, you know, pieces that I break, um, trimmings, etc. I reclaim all of it. I try to let the pieces dry as much as possible without creating any dust. The reason why I let the pieces dry as much as possible, especially trimmings, is because it then breaks down in water better versus if I had like a big chunk of clay that's still really wet I feel like if I put it in water it just won't disintegrate into smaller chunks and then I have to go in with my hands and really massage and break the pieces down so that's tip number one the second recommendation that I have is that I've switched to these wider mouth buckets I got them from Uline I really recommend for any buckets that you use for reclaim or for cleaning for water to get wider mouth ones like these it's not really the height or how much they carry it's just that because the opening is so much wider it's way easier to go in and clean things i have i think two more points that i want to share on how i keep my space clean especially when i have a home studio before i get into that just want to mention this is where i store all of my large glaze buckets so i've got like one two three five six of them here and I label them. It's really important that you label them because you start, if especially when the formulations are different, you start to forget which one is which. And sometimes I do even label like how much of a quantity of a certain raw material I, I put in there. So for example, if I'm using cobalt or if I'm using red iron oxide and I know that some of them are different or I'm just working on the formulation, I will write down label like, oh, I put like 0.5% or 1% of red iron oxide so that I know that when a new batch of pieces comes out and I feel like, oh, it's either needs more red iron oxide or less, then I will have remembered on the bucket. What I was trying to get to is I have two cleaning buckets here. I have one that's for cleaning tools with clay. I'm doing a lot of throwing, a lot of trimming, and so I have this uh, water bucket that I've placed about waist hip height because um, it's easier for me to clean without bending down. I find that when you do a lot of ceramics, you're hunching down and sitting a lot. So it feels good to be able to stand up and I can easily just put 
all my tools in here, wash them, and then store them back in the uh, storage bin. And then down here, can't really see. There's not really, it's not really important that you see it, but I have the exact same bucket with water in it too. But in there, it's all of my raw materials, glaze formulations. So if I'm glazing and I'm sponging and cleaning, I will only use that bucket. The dirty materials in that bucket are going to go to a waste fulfillment system. So right now the bucket's full of water. I'm going to let all of the glaze and materials um, fall to the bottom of the bucket. Once the water at the top is clear, I'll clear that out. And then what's at the bottom, that sludge, I'll collect it in a bag. And then I'll call the waste fulfillment system in my city that will know how to dispose of it properly. Like the other buckets, I'm using wider mouth buckets so that it's easier to clean large pieces as well. So I, if I have like a big plaster bat or something, it's also easier to clean in something that's has a wider opening. Also wanted to mention is that I've placed it close to my um, pottery wheel. So actually when I'm sitting on my pottery wheel like this, I can easily clean a lot of the clay that's on my hands. I usually have a little water um, bowl here as well, but I find that sometimes I just need to like say, get up and clean my hands. And having this here conveniently close to my wheel um, has been really helpful. In all seriousness, this mop and bucket is great. I uh, really like, not that I'm advertising for it, but I, I do really recommend getting a system that um, separates the clean water from the dirty water. It's really easy for me to discard of the dirty water once the clay has fallen to the bottom. The water that, when I dispose it, it's always extremely clear. There's no clay in it so I don't ever throw any clay down the drain. Another thing that I do to keep the space and air clean and dust free is I use an air purifier. This one is from Ikea. It's small, it's really lightweight, it's easy to transport around and it's not a product placement. I'm not sponsored. Wish I was. I use this a lot especially when I'm glazing because you don't want to be breathing the raw materials that go into the air. I do wear a respirator, of course, but um, the whole time while I'm formulating glazes, I will use an air purifier. Sometimes I do also run it in the space if I feel like it's just like an extra dusty feeling day, even though the rule in my studio, and I should have probably mentioned this earlier in the video, the rule in my studio is I do not let clay dry. Other than clay that goes in that reclaimed bucket, it is contained and most of the time it'll be maybe overnight and then I'll cover it with water. So there is no clay drying other than of course these pieces. I don't let clay dry on the wheel. I don't let clay dry on the floor and I try to clean up as I go every single time. So I make no exception to every single time I'm working in here, I have to clean up after myself and I always make time for that. So it usually takes maybe 10, 15 minutes. The other thing that I do as well to minimize cleaning time is I clean as I go. So for example, if I'm wedging over here, grab my sponge that was conveniently stored here and I'll just wipe until there's no more drying clay. And really I find that if you're methodical and you're rigorous, meaning you clean up after yourself as often as you can and you clean up after you're done at the end of the day, then I don't find that this space gets really dirty. Okay, a few more questions came in. Let's see, I just started a pottery class and it's so hard. Do you have some advice on how to get better? I would say, first of all, Pottery is very hard. It's very hard, especially if you're not used to failing and having to start over. I think that you should go in with lower expectations. Everyone starts out this way. And I think that failing is a big part of pottery. Failing and then starting over again in order to get better. 
you really have to practice a lot. Even if you're like you're learning a musical instrument or even if you're doing sports, it's the same thing. If you notice that you're having difficulty with some aspects of it, say like centering the clay or your piece keeps flopping, then I would just focus on just that before you go on to the next step. A few tips about centering the clay. I found one that really helped um, was squeezing my knees. So I would squeeze the wheel between your knees. It'll help your body assess better where the center of gravity in this rotating wheel is. The second thing I would say is slow down. A lot of people go really quick and then it starts to get worse and worse and then it flops. I would say, and this happens to me still all the time, whenever something goes a little off center, gets a little wobbly or a little out of control, slow down the wheel. Knowing when to accelerate and when to slow down is gonna make a huge difference. So I have a, actually a mug here. I mean, not a mug, it's a mug to be. But when I'm working at the bottom of the piece, my wheel is fast, but then as I'm going up, I slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down, as my fingers are going up. And that's going to help you a ton. Pottery is a very embodied art form. So it not only requires your mind's focus, it also requires your hands and your body to work with the clay and to use your sensations to feel how wet it is, the speed. And I think that it's important to be in a relaxed, calm state in order to tune in with your body and then feel the clay. Does this make any sense? For example, taking a deep breath before you're about to center a piece, or if you're struggling with centering a piece, take a deep breath, recenter yourself, reground yourself, then go again because if you're really frustrated and you're feeling a lot of emotion or even i find that if i think about a lot of negative thoughts I feel like you can see that frustration <laughs> in the piece and when i'm thinking about more positive thoughts and or just letting my my, my mind roam around um, my piece is a lot more peaceful to this point i think that tuning in into your body and into looking into what you're feeling there's a lot of there's a lot of wisdom there. Like your, your body knows what it wants to say and your mind wants to control and hyper control things. And I think that can be tied sometimes to fears that you've had in the past of losing control. And it's okay sometimes to give in and see where it goes and experiment because you will learn a lot from experimenting and practicing. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up on that. Last tip on advice on how to get better at pottery is to watch a lot of videos. Um, I, I'll link um, someone's channel that I watch a lot. His name is Xuan Xin. Uh, he has really good tutorials on how to get started on pottery. Um, moving on, do I have any books that I recommend for glazing and um, any recommendations for getting started on making your own glaze formulas? I don't have the books with me right now, but there are two books that I'm going to insert here. Um, that are really helpful. One of them is in French. Unfortunately, I don't know if it's translated in English. The other one is translated from French. It's by Daniel de Montmolin, and that one runs you through an exercise in order to understand how to make glazes and how to formulate them. Books by Linda Bloomfield also are very helpful. She has a couple videos on YouTube too that I'll link down below. Lastly, the resource that also I found really helpful was glazy.org. It's basically a database or a big forum for people to post the recipes and glaze formulas that they like. And once you start to go through recipes, you can start to figure out, oh, okay, it seems like a lot of people use cobalt for blue. What else? Let's see. A question from a friend who asks, how many times have you acted out the scene from Ghost? Well, Robbie, I have not seen Ghost, so I don't know what you're talking about. Um, another question from my friend Dylan. <laughs> Hi, Dylan. What inspired you to become a ceramicist and what keeps you inspired? The question also relates to another question that I got, which is, can, you, can I share how I got started in ceramics? So I think I've always been drawn to ceramics to be fair. Um, I do remember I did some ceramics, like I just played with clay, not even on the wheel. When my mother took my brother and I to a pottery studio and I remember 
It was in this big like flower market and there was like a pottery studio. I actually have a photo of one of the first pieces I made. I think it's the only piece that we ever fired. I do also have a very vivid memory of really being jealous as a child that all my friends had Play-Doh at their houses and we didn't have Play-Doh. I don't know, my parents were just not into buying Play-Doh. And I, every time my friends had Play-Doh at their houses, I would become very obsessed with it. And then uh, about, I don't know, eight years ago or something, uh, my friend has a screenshot of a chat uh, where we were messaging each other and I said, do you want to come to a pottery class with me? And I sent her a link to a pottery class and I never did. I never went, but it took me many, many years to have the courage to actually go and take a pottery class. It was right after the pandemic's first lockdown. I took a three week class with Michelle Ross, who runs Mima, or she's also known as Mima Ceramics. I'll link her down below. Uh, I joined a group class. We did three weeks together and then she also was running a community like memberships in her studio and I joined and I went as often as I could and I just really, really became obsessed. I loved it. It was very therapeutic. I think for me, uh, ceramics is very meditative. There's something, but there's the tactility of ceramics is very sensual and very primitive as well which i kind of like the second part of the question is what keeps you inspired that's a really good question i think it's that ceramics for me is more like making art versus designing for a commercial end i think i've spent so long in the commercial industry as a main job that it feels really liberating to look inside and see what do I want to say? What do I want to express? What are my opinions on the world? To do something for myself. I think I'm also thinking a lot about what we leave after we die on this earth. I know a lot of people don't like to think about death, but I've been thinking a lot more about death and, and what's the point of living and what's, you know, what is a meaningful life. And I think doing ceramics somehow it just feels like it's part of doing something a little more meaningful and significant with my life. And then lastly, of course, I'm really inspired by other people's work. I'm really inspired by Magdalene Odundo. I'm really inspired by Lucy Rhee. They're both two women ceramicists. Yeah, just like being inspired by other people's great work and wanting to emulate some of that in order to understand it better. So yeah, I guess for the sake of art. Oh my gosh, two more questions came in as I'm recording this video. I was just about to wrap up. What inspired you to pursue ceramics slash pottery? I guess I answered that question. Thank you so much for sending in this question. I will add to that that I think that I um, was very fortunate to grow up with parents who decorated our house with a lot of handmade work by artisans as opposed to mass manufactured stuff. Um, my mom sourced a lot of textiles, for example, by the Miao tribes um, who are in South China and South Southeastern Asia. She's also collected paintings by a painter from the Nashi community who you can look up. I think that seeing them put so much value on work that is handmade, that there is a person behind who has spent countless hours crafting it to make it beautiful and that's where the value is someone else asks i am moving back to toronto soon smiley face is there a sort of community for toronto potters yes yes and no um i'm gonna say that definitely check out akin collective that i mentioned earlier where rose has her kiln because she has her kiln it's drawn a lot of ceramicists to be in that um, building a lot of talented people there a lot of people making really cool stuff and everyone's really really nice extremely supportive everyone that i've met there has just been so encouraging and just really supportive and great and i think that following potters in the toronto area and sending dms commenting being encouraging and supportive um that helps even going to markets if people are selling stuff at markets just to say hi and so i feel like there is a community yes however 
I do also feel that Toronto is a difficult city to be a ceramicist. It's really hard to find a studio space unless you get really lucky, and I hope you do. It's just very expensive. It's very hard to find a kiln. A lot of kiln places that used to rent before don't rent anymore or have closed. It just takes a lot of energy and courage to keep on going in this city. But the ceramics community so far, everyone that I've interacted with is extremely nice and supportive. All right, last refresh before we wrap up this video. If there's any more questions coming in, Let's see. Nope, that's it. All right. Thank you to everyone who submitted their questions. I hope you enjoy this video. Give it a like if you did. I definitely enjoyed making this and chatting with you guys. Thank you for coming over. It's always a pleasure. And yeah, see you soon. Bye.